Warning, this episode contains details that may be triggering to some listeners, which include domestic violence and violence against children, both resulting in death. Listener discretion advised. Hey, Crime Salad listeners, welcome back to another episode of Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. My name is Ashley, and with me always is my husband and partner in crime, Ricky. All right, we have a few patrons to shout out. This week, we have Megan, Indy, Holly, and Anna. Thank you all so much for your support. We really, really appreciate you. All right, let's jump into the show. Ronald Lee Haskell, a recently fired Federal Express delivery man from San Diego, California, was out to deliver revenge on the afternoon of July 9, 2014. As he approached the small, one-story suburban home in Harris County, Spring, Texas, his anger and vengeance were foremost in his mind. Ron was hoping for the element of surprise, so in addition to his Federal Express uniform, he was also wearing a hat and dark sunglasses. He carried with him a pillow wrapped in duct tape he had disguised as a package. So with his package in hand, which he was hoping would act as a silencer, he knocked on the front door and was surprised to have it opened by 15-year-old Cassidy Stay. He asked if her parents were home, as he needed an adult to sign for the package. She said they weren't home, and he would need to come back later, and she quickly closed the door. This definitely didn't go as he had planned, and for a moment, he was stunned. He had spent the last few days stalking the family, and he was sure they should have all been at home. This was off to a bad start, but then he realized this might actually be better than his original plan. He decided that the fact the parents weren't home was even better for his nefarious purposes. He once again knocked on the door, and this time he was ready. Cassidy hesitantly opened the door, but this time there was an instantaneous spark of recognition in her eyes. She suddenly realized she knew this man. She knew this man was dangerous and unhinged, and she knew his presence meant her family was in danger. This wasn't a delivery man. It was her ex-uncle, Ron Haskell, and her entire family was terrified of him. He had been married to her mom's sister, her Aunt Melanie, and they were recently divorced. Out of instinct, she began pushing the door closed, but Ron wasn't going to be deterred so easily this time. He kicked the door open, startling Cassidy, who wasn't ready for the sudden explosion of violence. Once inside, she began to beg him not to hurt her and just leave. For just 15 years old, Cassidy was able to stay remarkably calm and did her best to protect herself and her four younger siblings who were also home that day. They were 13-year-old Brian Stay, 9-year-old Emily Stay, 7-year-old Rebecca Stay, and 4-year-old Zachary Stay. Ron dismissed her cries for mercy and demanded to know where her parents were, and more importantly, he wanted to know where his ex-wife Melanie Haskell and his children were staying. But Cassidy knew she couldn't tell this man anything. She insisted she didn't know anything as he methodically tied each one of them up and had them lay on the ground face down. Cassidy tried to connect with her ex-uncle and began telling him the names and ages of the children, hoping to humanize them and prevent him from harming them. To keep the children quiet and calm, she began praying with them, praying to God to protect them and change her uncle's heart towards them. Instead of being moved by the prayer, he taunted Cassidy and asked her what God said to her in reply. Cassidy did her best not to freak out, but she felt herself starting to panic because she knew Ron was a violent man. She knew he had beaten and harmed her Aunt Melanie and her cousins. 
About 45 minutes passed, and Cassidy's parents returned home, and Haskell moved them into the living room where he had their children. When Katie Stay saw her children all tied up, held at gunpoint by her sister's abusive ex-husband, she instantly lost control of her bladder. She was in utter shock and fear. She knew how dangerous he was, and more importantly, she knew he had nothing to lose. Ron once again demanded to know where his ex-wife had been staying. He kept saying, quote, I've come to get my kids. Where are my kids? End quote. He believed she and their children were possibly staying with the Stay family after he had staked out another family home in the area looking for them. Now that Ron had all the family members under his control, he continued raging, screaming, and demanding to know where Melanie and his four children were staying. But again, all members of the family refused to give him any information. They could tell by the things he was saying that he had been stalking other members of Melanie's family for days, hoping to find them. As they were all face down on the floor, the mother, Katie Stay, must have realized her family was in grave danger. And with her last remaining ounce of strength and courage, she fought back. She jumped up and she screamed no and used both hands, struggling with Ron, trying to take the gun out of his hands. She knew if she didn't act in that moment that not only would her family die, but so would her parents, siblings, and her nieces and nephews too. Katie wasn't ready to give up and she had every intention of taking that gun from Ron. That's when he shot her point blank in the chest without any warning. Katie Stay screamed and then fell on the floor. Her last act on this earth was fighting to save her family. It was the ultimate act of heroism. After he killed Katie, he took his gun and shot each family member in the back of the head, execution style. When he shot Katie, Cassidy hid her face and covered her ears and began screaming. As he shot everyone, Cassidy had the wherewithal to raise her hands to her head in an effort to protect herself. What Ron didn't know was that while the bullet went into Cassidy's skull, it first deflected off her hand, severing one of her fingers. But it didn't kill her. Later, Cassidy would tell authorities, quote, It was boom, 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 all in a row, rapid succession, moving down the line. It felt like time slowed down, end quote. After everyone had been shot, Cassidy heard a voice whisper in her ear to be quiet and pretend to be dead. So she stayed as still as possible and tried her best not to breathe or make any sounds. Even with a fractured skull and a bullet embedded in her head, she still had the strength to call 911 and tell them her family had been murdered and the rest of her family was in grave danger. She told authorities that Haskell planned to go to the homes of his ex-wife's other family members and kill them all. This was their punishment for helping Melanie and his children escape. She told the operator that her father had tried to save four-year-old Zachary by using his body to shield him, but when Ron realized Zach was still alive, he came back and shot him one more time, point-blank in the back of the head. Zach would die a few hours later at the hospital. In the meantime, the police were on a manhunt for a rampage killer. Cassidy was able to tell law enforcement that her uncle left in her parents' minivan, and he was likely heading to her grandparents' or her uncle's home. Later, Cassidy's other aunt, Ariel Leon, would say that when they heard Ron was coming for them, they fled their home without shoes to escape from Ron's wrath. They were frantic and in a panic because they all knew he had deadly intent and was heading their way. There were 23 more members of Melanie's family that Ron had on a kill list, and he had just executed six of them. Law enforcement were able to quickly locate Ron as he was approaching his former in-law's home. Apparently, he had stopped first at a fast food restaurant for a 32-ounce soft drink. I guess murdering innocent people can make you work up a thirst. As law enforcement attempted to pull him over, they engaged in a low-speed chase, which ended in a cul-de-sac after police put out spike strips to disable the tires on the Stay family minivan. At one point during the standoff, tactical officers used a large armored vehicle to ram the front of the car, further disabling it. Another armored vehicle was used to ram the rear of the car, preventing any meaningful chance of escape. 
There was a standoff for almost three and a half hours where Ron would occasionally put a gun up to his head and threaten to kill himself. Harris County Sheriff's Deputy Thomas Gilliland described Ron as cool as a cucumber. He never for a moment believed that Ron would kill himself. He said that when he and the other officers first approached him, he was, quote, just sitting in his car looking at us. At one point during the standoff, Ron told the hostage negotiator, quote, I'm not right in the head. I can't think right. You know I'm not coming out because I'm not going to jail. I just had my kids taken away from me. Haven't seen my kids for a year. When Ron was asked the ages of his kids, he said he didn't know. But they were all young. That's when he began setting up his defense strategy. He told the negotiator that he was a pretty good guy, but he began hearing voices and seeing hallucinations that told him that he had to come and protect his children and that his ex-wife's family were harming them. Eventually, Ron must have had to go to the bathroom after his big gulp because finally, without incident, he exited the vehicle, sank to his knees, and surrendered. But it wouldn't be the first time he sank to his knees. See, apparently Ron liked to tremble and fall to his knees quite a bit to convey his emotional fragility and physical weakness, all 300 pounds of him. Law enforcement stated that when Ron was told that Cassidy survived her gunshot wound, his face lost all color and he was visibly upset. During a press conference, the sheriff's department confirmed that the precinct deputy constables were called to a house on Leaflet Drive about 6 p.m. Wednesday, July 14th, 2014, and inside found a couple and three children dead. Another child later died at the hospital. He also told them that a 15-year-old girl had survived and was in very critical condition at the Memorial Hermann Hospital. During the preliminary hearing, when Ron learned the list of charges against him included capital murder, he fainted. He was helped up into a chair where he promptly fell a second time to his knees and was eventually wheeled out of the courtroom in an office chair by the deputies. Ron's attorney, Doug, told the press that Ron had gone off his meds prior to the shooting and he didn't believe his client could legally be responsible for his actions. He stated, quote, I think the evidence is going to show he is a troubled individual and he has a history of mental illness. Well, Ron did have a history, but it wasn't for mental illness. Police discovered that Ron was born in a suburb of San Diego into a deeply religious Mormon family. As a child, his family relocated to Alaska where Ron attended high school and was later voted class clown as well as prom king. To say that Ron was well-liked would be an understatement. Ron first met Melanie in second grade when they both attended the same grade school and church ward. Eventually, their friendship became romantic after Ron completed his two-year church mission trip. Their families were good friends, and Ron's brother, Robert Haskell, was best friends with Stephen Stay, Melanie's brother-in-law, who was eventually shot and killed along with other members of Stephen's family. They all grew up together as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a religion that focuses on family, togetherness, community, and an afterlife spent together for all of eternity. Once your marriage is sealed in the LDS religion, it is a vow that is taken very seriously and not easily broken. So when Melanie found herself in an abusive relationship with the man they all described as a red-headed, affable, and funny Chris Farley type, she chose to suffer in silence for years. At first, she was too embarrassed to admit that she was abused, and later she was too scared to tell anyone. After 11 years of marriage, she bore four children with Ronald Haskell until she could no longer suffer in silence because the abuse was escalating and she feared he would kill her. In one incident, Ron had pulled Melanie to the ground by her hair, kicked and punched her before choking her until she passed out. Melanie would later testify that, quote, I was too afraid to leave. 
He promised me if the secret was ever to be known, he would make me watch my family die, end quote. In fact, his outburst and the abuse were becoming more and more frequent. This was the side of Ron he only showed to the family, and Melanie was realizing this was the real Ron. There was no good Ron. The man who laughed and joked and helped his friends was the facade. The real Ron was the monster he saved for all of those who had been able to trust him the most, yet he treated them the worst. Melanie had finally had enough and had Ron arrested for domestic violence related to charges in 2008. However, in a plea agreement with prosecutors, the charges were reduced to simple assault. To compound Melanie's predicament, Ron's family was urging Melanie to work it out with her husband and remember that they had taken vows before God. Ron, too, wanted to work it out. He agreed to attend anger management classes, and he promised to change. But of course, that was all a lie. If anything, Melanie's betrayal made him angrier, and the abuse continued in both frequency and severity. Once again, Melanie found herself having to flee from her husband's wrath. Each time Melanie tried to escape him, he fought harder and harder to keep her under his control. One of the ways he did this was by promising her that he would not only kill her, he would also kill anyone who helped her to leave him. Each time the police were called to the Haskell home, Ron would have a cooling off period, but soon again, the abuse would continue. But now it wasn't only Melanie he was abusing, he was also abusing their children. Public records show that just the next year in 2009, Ron called the police to report his wife missing. To gain their attention, he told them he believed she was unstable and likely going to harm herself. You see, this was just another thing that Ron did to Melanie. He would tell her that she was crazy and unstable, and if she left him, he would take custody of their four children. This was just another way that he controlled her. So during that call to police, he told his wife that he believed that she was having a breakdown and was going to harm herself. Later, when police followed up, he told them that he had found her and was taking her to the hospital to be committed. Records show that never happened. Then, a year after that incident, Melanie Haskell filed for an order of protection against her abusive husband. A judge granted the order, and she filed for divorce the following month. Melanie finally had the courage to reach out to her family, and her sister Katie Stay was instrumental in helping Melanie free herself from her abusive marriage. She personally went to Utah to help move Melanie and her four children to Texas. The divorce was an anguishing time for Ron, and he cried to anyone who would listen and insisted that Melanie had cheated on him and he no longer wanted to live. He had threatened suicide regularly. Records show that Ron's brother in California contacted police and asked them to perform a welfare check because he was worried that Ron might harm himself. Robert Haskell later called back and told police he spoke with Ron and that he was fine. That's when the family decision was made for Ron to move back home to California with his parents until he could get himself together and get back on his feet. In July of 2013, Melanie had filed another protective order against Ron in Cache County, Utah, where they lived at the time. Haskell's protective order was converted to a mutual restraining order as part of their divorce and custody proceedings. This crucial step likely meant that Haskell was legally allowed to have guns again under both state and federal law, although this wouldn't be how he got the gun he used to kill the state family. We'll get back to that a little later. The judge also ordered that Ron's visit with his children would be supervised by a psychologist. The judge also allowed Melanie to leave the state of Utah with her children to be closer to family support in Texas. The judge wrote in his order that, quote, Mr. Haskell's parent time will be supervised until such time that his physical therapist can report that the respondent is no longer a threat to the children, end quote. A relative of Ron's told NBC News that after the divorce, he had been living quietly with his parents in California. They said that the family didn't understand why Ron had treated Melanie so badly, and it devastated their family. A friend of Ron's provided authorities with some of the backstory regarding Ron's evil plan to kill Melanie's family. He believed it started during the final court hearing in February of 2014, when Melanie was granted her divorce decree. 
Ron's friend from high school, Ben Thayer, told the Houston Chronicle that the Ron he knew was funny and kind and could have never killed anyone. He said that everyone loved Ron and everyone wanted to be around him because he was so funny and would make people laugh. He said that it's possible that Ron was insecure because he joked a lot and would often make fun of himself. Another friend of Ron's stated that he talked to him right after he and Melanie divorced, and he said that it devastated Ron that Melanie and her family would turn on him. He said that as they left the court hearing that day, he saw Melanie laughing and smiling, and she high-fived her sister Katie Stay. They were celebrating the end of Melanie's marriage while Ron was mourning the end of that same marriage. His friend believed that was when Ron had cemented his plans to take revenge. But Melanie wasn't the only person to endure Ron's erratic and abusive behavior. Now that he was living back at home again, he took out his anger on his siblings and parents too, once threatening to push his wheelchair-bound father down the stairs until his brother, Robert Haskell, physically intervened. He had to body slam Ron to the ground to protect his father. The only thing holding Ron back from carrying out his evil plan was the fact that he didn't know where Melanie was living and his children were instructed not to give him any information during their phone calls with their father. Melanie's sister recalled one phone call where Ron was asking his children about his aunt's schedule. He wanted to know where his cousins attended school and daycare. Ariel Leon thought that this was a huge red flag, and she immediately feared for her family's safety. They believed that Ron was planning something, but they never could have imagined what would actually happen. During Ron's capital murder trial, his mother testified on his behalf in an effort to show that her son was mentally ill. The story she told was chilling, given it was likely the catalyst to a murder spree he had been planning for a very long time. She told the jury that on July 3rd, 2014, she innocently asked Ron if he had a check that belonged to Melanie. This question set Ron off because he did have a check he had intercepted that belonged to his ex-wife, and the only way his mother could have known that was if she was in communication with Melanie. Ron's mother, Carla Jeanne Haskell, described her son's anger as ferocious. He demanded to know what information she had on Melanie's whereabouts and her phone number, which his mother refused to give him. He attacked her pushing her to the ground and jumping on top of her. He hit her and strangled her until she passed out and lost consciousness. He dragged her into the garage, tying her wrists together with duct tape before tying her to a computer chair. This was his mother that he was doing this to. She told the jury, quote, He yelled at me and twice placed his hands around my neck, trying to choke me and cause me to pass out. He told me he was going to kill me, my family, and any officers who stopped him. He hid my telephones. I lost control of my bowels, and I was taped up for four hours, end quote. Eventually, Carla Haskell was found by her daughter, and they called 911 to report the vicious attack. Ron had gotten into an altercation the prior fall with his sister Chandra Haskell. During that altercation, Ron was screaming at his sister, who tried to stop him from choking their 61-year-old mother. When his sister, 40-year-old Chandra, tried to intervene, Ron attacked her too. As a result of this incident, Chandra requested a restraining order and that her brother be removed from her parents' home because she felt that they were at risk being near him. Unfortunately, she didn't have legal standing to make that request, but the court did grant her a restraining order. As a result of the attack on July 3rd, his mother filed a restraining order of her own, and this time she requested that Ron now be prevented from coming anywhere near her, her husband, or their home. As a result, Ron was effectively homeless. Ron had nothing to lose, and he had a long list of people he felt had wronged him. From San Marcos, California, Ron headed to Utah to an ex-girlfriend's home. On July 4th, a woman who used to date Ron reported that her home had been burglarized and a 9mm pistol had been stolen. The same day, law enforcement discovered that Ron had gone to a store in Ogden, Utah and purchased a large quantity of 9mm bullets, earplugs, and he also purchased an extra gun magazine for the bullets and a laser sight for a firearm. Additionally, he purchased several other items to make a homemade silencer. 
After all of those purchases, he worked up an appetite and stopped in Las Vegas, Nevada and bought himself what he probably felt was a well-deserved steak dinner. He was celebrating as his evil plan was coming together. Later, the prosecutor would say, this all showed presence of mind in clear and methodical thinking. These were not the actions of a man hearing voices and seeing hallucinations, nor were they as a result of the voice telling him coincidentally kill all the people he happened to have listed on a revenge list found in his car. The prosecutor would later argue that Ron knew what was going on. He had a functioning brain that he had concocted an evil plan and he clearly knew the difference between right and wrong at the time of his crimes. There was a receipt in his car that showed he had the foresight to obtain a confirmation number for a dinner reservation for one on his way to Harris County, Texas. Ron was clearly celebrating in advance of his planned massacre of the entire Stay family. The prosecutor argued this wasn't a man who was mentally ill. This was a man who suffered from garden, variety, narcissism, and wasn't going to allow Melanie to win. She argued that Ron was not suffering from diminished capacity, but rather he was suffering from blind rage, something that was very much within his control. She told the jury that Melanie had humiliated and infuriated him at the courthouse when she celebrated the end of their marriage. In October 2019, the jury found Ronald Lee Haskell guilty of capital murder and handed down a death sentence by lethal injection. He had famously stated to law enforcement that he had no feelings of remorse for his actions because he didn't feel responsible for their deaths. Cassidy Stay had something to say about his lack of remorse at his sentencing hearing. The community rallied around Cassidy in the days after her entire family was murdered and a GoFundMe for her educational and mental health needs raised over $400,000. At her family's memorial service, Cassidy quoted from her favorite Harry Potter book. She said, quote, In The Prisoner of Azkaban, Dumbledore says, Happiness can be found in the darkest of times, if only one remembers to turn on the light, end quote. Many took note of her stoic bravery, including the Harry Potter author herself, J.K. Rowling, Rowling sent Cassidy a private care package that included a personalized letter purportedly written by the fictional headmaster Dumbledore. She also sent a personalized heartfelt letter of condolences for Cassidy and her family. Cassidy and her family eventually closed the fundraiser and released a statement that said, quote, We have reached an amazing milestone on a fundraising site and wish to close it as we acknowledge our infinite appreciation to all who have contributed. The generosity of the local, state, and national, and even global community has humbled us beyond our ability to convey. At this time, we hope everyone will continue to reach out to those in our various communities with the same care and love that has been shown to us." End quote. Cassidy Stay has since graduated from college and is married as she navigates her new normal with the same love and grace she was raised in for the first 15 years of her life. If you or a loved one is experiencing domestic violence, there are resources available to help. The National Domestic Violence Hotline can be reached 24-7 at 800-799-7233 or by text at 88788. Thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. We will be with you next week. Crime Salad is a Weird Salad production. Are you kidding me? That was perfect.